This is Matthew Stanley, the host of Samsara Audio, bringing you the final Samsara Audio episode of the year. This week's episode has my friend Quinn Wellahan joining me for a conversation on the encounter of Buddhist philosophy and Western philosophy. Quinn is a student of Buddhism, but also a close reader of Hegel. On this episode, we talk about how to read Nagarjuna, one of the most challenging Buddhist philosophers, and Quinn provides us with an introduction to Nagarjuna's fourfold logic. Then we put Nagarjuna into conversation with Hegel to better clarify the way that the two traditions treat consciousness, thinking, and especially contradiction. We close with a discussion comparing and contrasting Buddhist meditation with psychoanalysis, looking at the difference in how they treat disturbances. Thanks for listening to Samsara Audio this week. Let's dive right in. All right, welcome to Samsara Audio. Today, I've got my friend Quinn on. I met Quinn through the Philosophy Portal group. I'm not sure if other folks know about Philosophy Portal. It's a fantastic community run by Cadell Last. I'll link it in the show notes, and I've talked about it, I think, before on this show. Quinn, I think you were in the Hegel seminar last year, reading the Science of Logic. Yeah, yeah, I've done the Phenomenology of Spirit course, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and then the Science of Logic was the most recent one. I think that's when we connected was at the Science of Logic conference. Yeah, I saw your presentation at the conference and I was like, okay, I think I got a message of this guy. So <laughs> <laughs> always looking for people who are read in Buddhist philosophy and want to chat, especially people who know uh, Western philosophy too. I just love that dialogue space. Since you're coming from the opposite direction, you know, I kind of came from this Christian background, Western philosophy to Buddhism. My understanding is you came the other direction, like a little bit more into Buddhist philosophy and then started to pick up guys like Hegel and Nietzsche. I would love for you to share your story with the audience of how did you come to Buddhist philosophy and then how did you make this transition to reading Hegel and Nietzsche? who are, you know, just very different types of thinkers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally different styles and traditions. Yeah. I, as you said, I sort of, my first real fascination and interest philosophically was Buddhism. I think I took a course on foundational Buddhism my freshman year of college, and it kind of got me hooked. I uh, found it very provocative. And I was like, okay, this seems like an interesting direction to go. And then I ended up actually doing my undergrad at this school called Naropa University. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was founded by this Tibetan sort of Buddhist teacher, Chogyam Trumpa. And the founding vision of it is this dialogue between East and West between mainly a kind of Buddhism, Western psychology, uh, Western religion, not as much of an emphasis on Western philosophy so much, but definitely at the heart, this fruitful clash between uh, the East and West, if we want to use those really broad categories. I was always loosely interested in Western philosophy as well, and didn't really get that in my undergrad. So it was kind of, it was actually dur during my undergrad that I started diving into, um, I read Baudrillard, like Marshall McLuhan, Kierkegaard, a little bit of Nietzsche, just kind of on my own, fumbling, fumbling my way through, and then encountered uh, the phenomenology of spirit and Hegel and just it didn't understand it whatsoever and luckily found my way to Goodell's course. So had a little guide through that. And then, yeah, just continued to be really interested in bringing these two very different traditions together uh, with the foundational presupposition that maybe we can think different thought avenues through this clash. I wonder if you resonate with this description in the East West dialogue that goes on. I kind of feel like Westerners have a bit of a inferiority complex almost like, oh, the East is this deep and mystical place and <laughs> yeah. they have so much to offer us and we're just so individualistic and wrong and atomistic. And I find that it tends to be a little one-sided in this dialogue where it's more about look at the mystery that the East has to bring and the West just needs to kind of get on board. And I sometimes yeah. I feel like the strengths of the West are not so much um brought forward or considered and i'm wondering like what is your read on that 
because there's different places this discourse is happening, but I think there right. is a lot of this East West discourse that goes on. And I'm curious to see what you think about uh, where that goes well, where it doesn't. Yeah, sure. Even my own story is maybe characteristic of that movement. There's definitely something sexy and exotic about this foreign body of knowledge to the extent that it feels esoteric. It feels novel. You know, I think when Buddhism came to the West and like the 1960s with various teachers, there was the whole movement of going East and finding some sort of spiritual knowledge and awakening. So I definitely see that trend as well. Um, for me, there's definitely a richness in Western speculative thought that I think I was kind of hungry for and maybe didn't find as much of that in my encounter with Buddhism. I mean, Nargarjuna, definitely, that was sort of my uh, attraction to him. I th saw him as the most philosophically rigorous of Eastern thinkers that I encountered. I think maybe the emphasis in at least certain schools of Buddhism is on the pragmatics of meditation practice and the ability to engage in these disciplines that have an immediate change in one's um, perceptual experience of reality and the Western tradition of thought feeling uh, maybe more unapproachable to some. That would probably be my intuition there. Quinn, what is your meditation practice like and how essential do you think it is to understanding Buddhist thought? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, I think to the extent that we, we can say there's a development in Buddhist ontology or metaphysics, I think it's intimately tied to meditation practice and the kind of shifts in one's perception, experience, phenomenology that lends itself then to um, the philosophical exposition. So I think, at least in the history of Buddhism, it's absolutely essential and definitely in my own personal journey with this, the meditation practice definitely has enriched the more analytical and philosophical exploration for sure. And yeah, I mainly have practiced in the Tibetan tradition with shamatha and Vipassana meditation. That's kind of been where I've gone with that as well. And I think in my own experience, you know, it's, it definitely can shift thinking as well in the, the manner in which you approach philosophy. Um, so there's definitely an intimate connection. You mentioned Nagarjuna and in Nagarjuna's fundamental sentences of the middle way, there isn't a lot of discussion of meditation, at least from yeah. what I've read. And so I wanted to, to dive into that text just because you, you know, Nagarjuna, I've been doing a reading group on him recently and, and he's like, you mentioned, I think the most philosophically rigorous of any of the Buddhist thinkers. I mean, he's kind of this fountain for Mahayana thought in, yep. in East Asia. So I'm curious. There's a lot of questions I have about it, but just to kind of continue this line of thought, is the fundamental sentences of the middle way, is it something that you can understand outside of meditation or is it about meditation, even though it's never talked about? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think at least how I read Nargajuna's work is he is trying to give a kind of analytical and philosophical weight to what he saw as the Buddha's original teachings and challenge and deconstruct some of the various ontologies that had emerged during his time, whether Buddhist or non-Buddhist. I mean, there's definitely, although he doesn't really explicitly mention who he's conversationally dueling in his work, it seems clear that he's definitely interacting with certain views of foundational Buddhism at the time that kind of 
had a certain realist metaphysics that saw moments of time and atoms as really existing. And so he's, um, I think, trying to illuminate that misunderstanding and clarify what he saw as the intention of the Buddha's teaching. And yeah, it's an interesting question of the of the connection with meditation. And I think this is kind of speculation, but I think his analytical work is trying to ignite or bring about a similar kind of perspective shift and transformation in the fundamental architecture of, of experience that something like meditation practice helps to bring about. In the commentary that I have read, Chandra Kirti, who comes after Nagarjuna, has a sort of explicating and enunciating Nagarjuna's work. And he mentions, I think, a few times um, the importance of meditation, insight practice, even moral development as well. Even though they're not explicitly mentioned, I think they're definitely present there. He, he even... Chandrakirti even notes that if you sort of solely approach Mahayana philosophy from the philosophical or analytical perspective, it can seem very similar to a kind of nihilism or even a kind of skepticism. Um, but there is, a prof there is a profound difference and a profound affirmation uh, of life. And I think meditation would be an important method to bring about that transformation and maybe avoid, I think, one of the, what Nagarjuna would see as one of the major pitfalls, the potential major pitfall, which is to cling to his notion of emptiness or shunyata itself as kind of a final ontological category in which to ground. One thing I find myself so frustrated by in reading Nagarjuna is I get the <laughs> sense that like you're pointing out that this is a very contextual intervention that he has very particular people he's talking to almost like a, a boy in the schoolyard who knows the exact guy like he had an argument with him over a beer last night like, <laughs> yeah. and like I like I'm writing this because I had this debate with so and so over there about the question of x y and z and here's why he's totally wrong and I wish that I could know more about his life and about the particular people he's writing against because I feel like that would be illuminating. But um, I, I don't know if that's just kind of the scholar in me or wanting to right. maybe control that insight or, or <laughs> not. But um, it because to me it makes it raises the question of how do you live in light of what Nagarjuna is doing with this logic that just kind of breaks everything down. Yeah. I feel like if you could see how he lived, you might understand to what use he put these seemingly skeptical arguments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. His life story is shrouded in all sorts of myth. You definitely don't get that kind of uh, historical granularity that would uh, please the scholar. For sure. And I definitely think you're right that he's, I see him as kind of a, a kind of a trickster, you know, who's very much responding to a certain, I guess, dogmatism of his day and even, yeah, a certain scholastic kind of attitude as well. And th that experience of frustration when first encountering him, I definitely resonate with that and share that. And I think that's, a sort of intentional feature of his thinking as well. Like there's even just the attempt to interpret Nagarjuna's thought. Is it, is it skepticism? Is it you know, nihilism? Is it monism? All, you know, all of these uh, attempts to kind of peg it to a certain ism or form of thought. It, it seems that built into the structure of his thinking is this self undermining feature <laughs> so that the reader, at least this is kind of my experience, the process of reading the text, you can notice your own discursive mind trying to pin him down, you know, okay, so is this his final position? Okay, no, he's going to negate that and, and deconstruct that. Oh, is this his final position? Um, and this kind of gets at his style of logic that, that I think is operating in the background, which 
happy to touch on if we want to get kind of technical, but. Yeah. Could you introduce the listeners to what is the distinctive feature of Nagarjuna's logic? Yeah, absolutely. And this, and this would extend to kind of like Mahayana or Majamaka logic as well. Nagarjuna was the foundational thinker for what's called Majamaka uh, philosophy. I'm probably butchering a lot of these names, so forgive me there. <laughs> so to try and outline Nagarjuna's logic, and maybe I'd preface it by saying he may be adverse to this move, you know, of trying to pin a logical form to him. But the general style is what's called a non-affirmative negation. So he goes about negating various positions. So in, in the beginning, he'll deconstruct causality and, and present the various positions like, oh, does a thing arise from itself? And he'll problematize that and show how that thought path runs into contradiction. Okay. So then maybe does a thing arise from something other than itself? And he'll go about and show how that runs into contradiction. And th th basically the non-affirmative negation is just a technical term for this logic that does not affirm the opposite of what it denies. So ultimately there is no affirmation of a final position. Um, and then another way to kind of approach it is looking at it from this form called the tetralemma, which basically explores four possible responses to a proposition. I mentioned the causality one. So the first one would be, okay, a thing uh, arises from itself, sort of an a, a equals a kind of logic. And that would be the first response. And there's four responses here that he generally goes through, although sometimes he only uses two or three. And then the second would be, okay, so does a thing arise from its other kind of A equals B. And then the third would be, does a thing arise from both itself and the other? And then he'll go about negating that. And then the final position is, does a thing arise from neither itself nor its other? And this loose form is kind of a th thread throughout his work. And he ends up ultimately negating all four positions. So in the notion of shunyata or emptiness is the fundamental kind of deconstruction of existence, non-existence, both existence and non-existence, neither existence or non-existence. Uh, and this kind of makes up the, the thread of the middle way that's kind of weaving between these dialectical alleyways of a realism that affirms existence and then a skepticism or nihilism that affirms non-existence. Uh, it seems like Nagarjuna is trying to drive at by negating all these ideas, one arrives sort of at an experience rather than yeah. something that is an idea. All ideas kind of fall away and they're never going to be adequate to whatever this experience is of hereness, nowness, thereness. Um, those aren't phrases he uses, obviously, but it kind of seems like the goal is to release oneself back into living in a non-conceptual way. There's definitely a deconstruction of thought itself that creates clearing maybe for a different type of experience of, of reality. I think Chandrakirti uses the language of like the suchness of things. So there's this recognition, I think, implicit in Nagarjuna of the way that thought, and maybe we could categorize it as a certain type of thinking that can distort or deceive in various ways or kind of block us for, from a more naked and direct confrontation with things. It makes me think about where Heidegger talks about how you only think about the hammer once it breaks. I was talking in the reading group we were chatting and one of the ladies said, you know, you don't think when you're cutting carrots, if you started thinking about cutting carrots, you would probably cut your finger instead of cutting the carrot. 
it's, it's almost like the concepts and the ideas, they aren't really what you're doing when you're doing the thing. And in fact, when they come in, it's almost like a symptom that something's going wrong. Yeah, yeah, that that's interesting. I think this gets into the, I would say, implicit metaphysics that Nargarjuna sees within common everyday language, thought, and experience, um, where there's this basic separation between subject and object. And this kind of mode of thinking is operative in the background. And we don't, we, it's, it's very functional. Like you're saying, when I go to make a cup of coffee in the morning, I don't have to think about the nature of the cup. I just fill it up, you know, or when I'm trying to build a house, I relate to the objects as sort of static identities. And so I think this, this manner of experience that's kind of bound by space and time, which relates to objects as kind of spatially frozen in some sense is I think part of the experiential architecture that Nagarjuna is problematizing, revealing, deconstructing in some form. Um, if you want to say more about Nagarjuna, let me know, but I almost feel like this is a good way to kind of segue to the question of Hegel, who you've spent quite a a lot of time reading as well. We have the tetralemma in Nagarjuna 4, whereas Hegel is famous for the dialectic, which has the structure of three. And I'm wondering, how does this experience of the four and nothingness and releasing back into non-conceptual living relate to Hegel, who the ultimate goal is the arrival at the concept? Right. And it arrives there through this perpetual act of negation and kind of has this threefold movement. I wonder if you could compare those for us and, um, yeah, just get into that. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's hard to know where to begin or where an en entryway is. I guess I'll start with kind of a technical point on the different logics at play here. With the like quadratic structure of the four moments, we have in the last two moments, a kind of mutual negation. Like if we take be being and non-being, which you could see as the first two moments of the tetralemma, there's an affirmation of being, and then, okay, there's an affirmation of non-being, and this is how Hegel begins his logic. And then the last two moments is sort of a recognition that, okay, <laughs> being um, sort of naturally turns into non-being. There's a reciprocal negation and also a reciprocal determination. So then you have sort of it's both being and non-being. So there's this constant movement back and forth, this vanishing into each other. And I think Hegel's notion of sublation kind of affirms the contradiction of these last two moments. So we have a quadratic structure turning into a triadic structure where the simultaneous negation is also a kind of affirmation and, and for him, the concept of becoming here is the resolution of this dialectical movement or this vanishing of being into non-being. And then this sort of opens up to his whole logic, which unfolds in this manner. And so it's kind of central distinction or maybe difference is the status of contradiction. For Nargarjuna, he's walking thought to this contradiction, showing a certain kind of impossibility of resolving these metaphysical questions through one of the four moments of the tetralemma. So we encounter contradiction, but it's kind of, you could say like relegated to a certain defect in thought. Um, and so he's still really operating on 
the principle of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle, which is uh, inherited from Aristotelian logic. And this is the fulcrum that Hegel's kind of inverting. So for Hegel, the confrontation with this contradiction is a positive feature of thinking and opens up a different form of, of logic. He sees this contradiction in thought that I would say Nargarjuna kind of reveals in his thinking as a sort of contact with the real. And so there's more of an emphasis on engaging this contradiction in thought rather than kind of always seeing this negative result that there is a kind, there is a positive result in uh, tearing with and working with this contradiction that one encounters in thinking. Instead of the non affirmative negation that you talked about, it's more like the affirmative contradiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's where yeah. instead of like, okay, well, I'm negating something, but I'm also not affirming its opposite. You're actually, you're just taking thought and pushing it to its limit. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Nargarjuna kind of does saturate the limits of a certain form of logic which is predicated on this on this non-contradiction and then after that sort of ig ignites this experiential realization of shunyato or, or a more like it does have implicitly a kind of positive result you know it's not this this nihilistic nothingness it becomes this ground of movement and activity it becomes sort of spontaneous and so, so there's implicitly, there's kind of a recognition that the, the negative result that you confront in thought is simultaneously has this positive and affirmative dimension. However, I would say he Hegel's then attempting to conceive a logic from that standpoint, where maybe in Nagarjuna and perhaps Buddhism more broadly, the affirmation is more at this non-conceptual level. I think that contrast is a really good way of putting it because it gets at this difference I see between Eastern and Western conversations and where the Western conversation wants to affirm this uniqueness about human beings where mm. our strangeness in the community of beings has this unique value where you can see it already in your description of Hegel where the ability to posit and affirm a contradiction in a Buddhist tradition can be read as a source of suffering, as an illusion, as a mistake. Like you got to figure out how to get past that because it's going to destroy you. Right. Whereas the West is like, oh, that's interesting. What if we just went as far as we could with it and just yeah. see what happens? It's the strange quirk of human beings is that we can posit a contradiction. Why don't we keep experimenting with that and see what we can do with it? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Hegel definitely has a higher regard for thinking itself, you know, and I think he would, af you know, affirm this, let's say, negative moment in the history of thought, which recognizes the error in a certain f form of logic, uh, a certain form of this non-contradictory logic. But I think Hegel would affirm affirm that error as something that we encounter through thinking, through taking thought to its limit, and that there is more thinking to be done on the other side of that process. I've been following Dimitri a lot, and Dimitri yeah. is somebody else in the philosophy portal. I really like his work. I've had him on Timsara Audio, and his emphasis on how the end is this return to the beginning. Mm -hmm. is you know it's all over hegel as you can probably tell but i've really appreciated the way that he's made that so central in his own writing of of the end of the dialectic process is actually just a coming home again to where you can set out on the journey afresh yeah yeah it's an it's a new beginning and i think that's lo you know logically i think that's kind of a one difference between the the quadratic structure which does collapse and seems to kind of return to where it began in some form, but with fresh eyes and a new perspective, you return home, but uh, kind of with a different lens. 
where where Hegel there is that circular motion, but the collapse of that particular form, the return is also simultaneously a new beginning, and it kind of it it marks. Uh, I think he uses like this. It's rather than just a circle. There's the circle of circles, so it keeps on moving. There's some some emergence that has a novel quality to it. Oh, and I wanted to touch on your point of human beings as as being sort of unique and separate from non-speaking, non-thinking beings and even the inert material world that there is this yeah there is a subtle uh, i don't know if it's a negative valuation of thought but just a recognition again of the deceptive quality that that thinking can have where, where the question i think you raised this in your paper which i like is kind of in, in Hegel, I think maybe Western thought more broadly, it's like through thinking this original kind of division that thought and language introduces is also the condition of possibility for um, different quality of being. There is a separation and that can be painful. There is a division, but that division is affirmed as a, it's an opening. I appreciate that you read the paper. That's very kind of you. Yeah, that was and... awesome. Yeah, I was really keyed in on that. I think that it's so fascinating to me, this fundamental value of question about, is it good that we're different from the other yeah. creatures? That human beings think about the fact that they're humans rather than a bird just birding or the world just worlding. World. I tend to like the approach that affirms and wants to integrate suffering instead of what feels like this desire to eliminate suffering. Um, and I don't want to be too negative on Buddhism because there's obviously ways that you could sort of in Buddhist thought, it's not just this happy clappy. We want to get rid of all suffering. You know, I, I definitely think it's more complex than that, but I do think that it can lead in that direction, which is why I think that Buddhism and stoicism kind of, it's like Western heretical cousin were taken up so much by this kind of transhumanist movement that wants to overcome death and eliminate suffering and help us live forever and, and be happy. And like in kind of the Bay area tech world and that's spreading around the world, there is this eschatology of we can eliminate suffering through optimizing our bodies and our minds. And I think that's really toxic. I'm super against it and I want mm. to oppose it. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if I were to kind of, steel man the the buddhist i mean i, I completely uh, agree with you like there's an important dimension in which suffering and despair and negativity and all of these things that we wrestle with as human beings isn't simply a, a futile affair but that it's part of what imbues life with meaning and perhaps you know death death being the absolute <laughs> negativity is also the ve the very thing which gives uh, our finitude its meaning and its significance in in a profound way uh, and i think in buddhism i mean of course there's the a certain teleology towards the alleviation of suffering for all sentient beings but there is also I think a place for really in engaging this discontent and this dis-ease that, that we feel that something is off, that the way towards an affirmation of life and an, a, a new kind of appreciation for life is found through engaging that in different forms. And maybe meditation is one of those forms. And so I think ultimately, I mean, even in, in Nagarjuna, you know, I don't, I read it not as a projection into some afterlife or some beyond, but ultimately coming back to this life here and now and affirming it in all of its challenges and antagonisms and um, difficulties. But I, yeah, I can see how certain, for, and this is maybe the distinction that, that takes place in the evolution of Buddhism between something like foundational Buddhism and then Mahayana, 
like Vajrayana and Tantric Buddhism, that in foundational Buddhism, there's more of the motion of kind of a renunciation, a withdrawal, a retreat from engaging life. And as you get into Mahayana Buddhism and, and Vajrayana, I think there's more of this emphasis on a deep engagement um, with, well, yeah, with the everyday minutia of life, that this is really, you know, this is really it. At, at first, it's, oh, this absolute discontent with samsara and, you know, a mediation towards nirvana or awakening. But then in Nargajuna, at least, there's the recognition that all along samsara it is nirvana, that they're sort of ontically the same thing. But that in order to see that, we have to go through this process rather than... Uh, or at least go through this process to recognize the way in which our mind is trying to project a kind of salvation and project a kind of reconciliation in a beyond. Um, kind of the Hegelian yeah. sense, whatever nirvana, this absolute that is arrived at, it needs to include samsara in itself and it has to work on it to get to that point where it can, it can even affirm samsara as a part of its own identity. I think there's, yeah, various ways in which we could think that dialectic between nirvana and, and samsara uh, as kind of maybe being similar to Hegel's dialectic between finitude and infinity and the true affirmation that comes with infinity that includes finitude within itself, includes its other within itself, that it is in that dialectical movement. Hegel's kind of interested in how we always project this beyond outside of ourselves, you know, finitude comes up and then we have this notion of infinity and it kind of perturbs us. Like in Buddhism, maybe you have some experience of uh, samadhi or, or nirvana and then you fall back into finite existence and you create this implicit separation between the two where nirvana is always in the future. It's something you have to strive for and, and get to. And ultimately through this process, there's a reconciliation with the endless striving and a return to the here and now, which has reconciled that division in, in some important way. I liked the way you put it of engaging the dis-ease that we have, like finding practices to engage that dis-ease. Meditation clearly seems like one that's needed. I had a question based on a conversation that I had with the Nagarjuna reading group. We were talking about the difference between Vipassana meditation and psychoanalysis. And I'd just be curious to get your take on this, where um, one of the other members in the group had just gotten back from a retreat and he was talking about his experience and about all the things that were coming up for him and how in the retreat they talked about you just let those things come up and then they burn off and the goal is to like if you don't give it space if you're not uh, affirming it you just kind of observe it eventually those things go away and i kind of commented on how this seems a bit like psychoanalysis and that the goal of psychoanalysis is just to get rid of all of the inhibitions so that everything just comes up well like freud describes just sitting on a train and watching the landscape go by and you just describe what you're seeing and that's the landscape you're describing is whatever comes into your mind but what's interesting is the difference between kind of the vipassana approach and psychoanalysis is that for psychoanalysis it has to be spoken in right. order to be worked through whereas in the vipassana approach if it can appear it can be observed noted it can burn off now this contrast between burning off and working through to me kind of emerged and it seems like a two contrasting methods of dealing with the world of dealing with objects of how do you work things through i'm curious if anything about this um, sparks thoughts for you or is res resonating with you at all yeah uh, this is this is super interesting i would preface it by saying my studies of psychoanalysis are in their infancy but i definitely have a few thoughts on this I like this notion of meditation being a process of kind of observing your psychophysical makeup, kind of free associating 
with itself, you know, you're observing sensations and thoughts and watching them kind of arise and pass away. And I think this is one method. And I think it really, you know, it really is a method of working through the natural effect of negativities that, that come with <laughs> being a human being. But the distinction that, that you made, I think is accurate where in psychoanalysis, there's emphasis placed on signifying it of actually bringing those affective negativities and disturbances through the symbolic, through language, and especially the way in which this is a method of reconciling the subject with its own history, um, where in, in meditation, there's less of an emphasis on this historical dimension. Thoughts may arise about the past or the future, but there's more of just that, that neutral observation that's watching those arise and pass away rather than the method that's trying to, I would say also identify the way in which part of those affective negativities and disturbances are bound up with language and the signifier so that the, like the catharsis and the liberating quality comes with kind of mo exhausting your own, your own story in some sense, your own history that this might be able to reach a certain dimension that meditation maybe cannot. And I would say, you know, vice versa, like maybe there's a way in which meditation is a method of mediating our essence that has certain effects that psychoanalysis may not have. Um, yeah. I think it's like the comparison between the two is fruitful though, as you pointed yeah. out. And I think that being able to bring those things up in meditation, it ha it can have this similar effect where you're trying to dredge things up in order for them to be engaged and worked with and not speaking them i think can be a form of working with them i think that there is something to be thought about there of like what type of work is being done in meditation versus psychoanalysis because I, I, I like how meditation testifies to some of the viciousness of the circle that thought can get locked into. Yeah. You know, it testifies to that trap that can be fallen into, but also psychoanalysis. And I think Hegel, to an extent, testify to the power of being able to engage that and to mobilize it and to, for something new to come out of that process. Whereas you take the detritus, you push it through the kind of signifier machine and something else unexpected can come out of it on the other side. Yeah. I think Hegel has this, his lectures on logic. He, he talks about logic doing a kind of violence to the understanding. And I think in, in some ways, you know, psychoanalysis recognize the ways in which the subject is bound up and tangled with language and tangled with the symbolic and through kind of this free associative process is kind of jousting back with it. It's really wrestling with it and working through it in a different kind of way. And I, I, the other thing that came to mind here is the importance of the analyst in this process. Med meditation is more of an intrapsychic process where psychoanalysis, you have the other sort of observing and the transference dynamics that emerge in that. And maybe in Buddhism, there's the teacher student relationship where those things can kind of be worked through. But I think the, in the centrality of transference there as a important way of working through this discontent, dis-ease, um, and suffering that we experience, that it's bound up with the other in an important way. I love the idea of reading koans as like an analysis session. That would be a really interesting interpretive framework to bring to a koan to see the teacher as the analyst and the student as the analyzand and the response of the teacher that leads to enlightenment as some sort of a psychoanalytic intervention. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think looking at the yeah, guru disciple or student teacher relationship through this perspective of transference, I mean, I think that's a lot of what's going on. And like the teacher is constantly subverting the 
subjects projection of the big other onto them like oh this you know this person has the secret knowledge that that they're gonna sort of bestow on me uh and the the teacher the guru is co sort of constantly undermining their own authority as the subject's supposed to know uh at least the good ones <laughs> and maybe the koan is kind of an example of this that frustrates the analytical mind which is looking oh there's some correct uh some correct reconciliation and, and resolution to this uh to this question or this problem but it's just rather the exhaustion of the mind in engaging a certain kind of contradiction whereby it self-destructs i wanted to move us towards a conclusion here but i wanted to find out where are you going next like in terms of reading hegel uh, reading buddhist philosophy where else are you taking these ideas and into what other realms are you starting to make your way? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank, thanks for having me on. This was fun. Um, I am slowly engaging more with psychoanalysis. So that's kind of the next thought train that I'm getting on board with. And then in my Buddhist studies, moving more into like Vajrayana, um, studies as well, and kind of seeing how that evolves and expands uh, from this Mahayana foundation, this central insight of Shunyata that comes with Mahayana philosophy, like just seeing the different ways that techniques and technologies and different forms of mediation are, are developed from that foundation in Vajrayana, kind of engaging more with the practices of those as well. And then yeah, continuing to study Hegel for sure. He's someone that can endlessly return to, I think, and requires multiple readings. So that'll definitely be a decade long relationship, I imagine. <laughs> I assume that you've got a contribution coming up for the anthology, the, the Hegel anthology that Philosophy Portal is putting together. Yep. Planning on it. Yep. Great. Yeah, exploring some of the things that we've talked about today and deepening the dialogue between Hegel and, and Nagarjuna, seeing where that leads. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. I appreciate your time, Quinn. It was great talking. It's rare to be able to have a conversation where these kind of ideas can intersect so well so i'm really thankful for the opportunity and i'll be sure to link to your work if there's anywhere that people can follow you in the show notes as well but overall i would just recommend if you want to be around folks like quinn uh, to read texts like hegel uh, i would recommend checking out the philosophy portal community um, i think that i can speak for both of us when i say we've both really uh, benefited from the diversity of the community there but also just the quality of engagement and people doing the hard work of reading and thinking in the community absolutely thanks for listening to samsara audio this is your host matthew although samsara audio started as a small experiment just talking to myself in my car it grew into an eight episode season this year if you'd like to catch up on prior episodes you can listen to Samsara Audio on your favorite podcasting app, such as Spotify or Apple Music, or you can subscribe and listen directly at Substack at samsara.substack.com. If you'd like to encounter more conversations like these ones, you can also follow my free newsletter, Samsara Diagnostics, where I write free weekly essays on topics in religion, philosophy, and psychoanalysis. Samsara Audio will be taking a break for the rest of the year, but it will be back again in the new year. Thanks so much and talk to you next year, friends.